today because there's no class on Thursday, the last I checked. Uh, so have a lovely holiday. And then you have your project check-ins are due tomorrow. There was a valiant effort on, on Piazza to extend, but if I do that, then I'll get people unhappy that the, you know, they worked hard to reach this deadline. Anyway, there's no winning here, so we're just going to stick with the, with the calendar that's, that, that you've had since day one. Um, and it's just a check-in. Like, we're just looking for like, a, a little bit of text and, and uh, you know, a screenshot, that, some evidence that you've actually written some code. Uh, and then after that, you have your project presentation and, and write up, and, and we're good. Uh, if you guys have questions about how your semester is going and all that stuff, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, again, remember that uh, this course is really straightforward when it comes to grading. Like, there's a formula on the syllabus, and you can work out your progress according to that, and, and then we'll just, you know, come up with cutoffs and, and go from there. Uh, any questions about, you know, procedural, logistical stuff? I think it's pretty straightforward from here. Cool, and I, I believe there's already a thing on learning modules for you to turn in your, your check-in. Is that, is that right? TAs? Yep, thumbs up. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, so you should be all good. Uh, you can feel free to turn it in early if you want. That, that's perfectly fine, and then, then you'll have a relaxing holiday. Uh, okay, so uh, in that case, without further ado, we'll get started with my least favorite lecture in this course. Uh, as you probably know, your instructor is a theorist. One of the fun things about computer graphics as a discipline is there's this huge spectrum all the way from like math to hardware that happens. And uh, all of us researchers in this area live in different parts of that spectrum. I'm very much on the left-hand side. Uh, but of course, uh, in a graphics class, we should cover all the different pieces of the graphics pipeline. And there's one mysterious object that we've managed to skirt around all the way until today, uh, which is the actual thing that's doing the rendering on your computer, uh, namely your graphics card. Uh, and of course, it's important for at least one lecture in this course to kind of understand what's actually going on inside of this magical box that you know, is, is slowly destroying our environment uh, inside of all of your machines, and, and, and to, to sort of understand how we build these architectures and just really the kind of amazing ballet that happens inside of these devices uh, to just do this stupid number of calculations in parallel. Uh, so that's our, our goal today, uh, with lots of materials stolen from my colleagues' slides, because again, this is not my area of expertise, but I did spend all day today trying to understand what the heck is going on in here. And I had an office full of my own graduate students all trying to read these like NVIDIA specs to understand this weird fancy language these people use. Uh, okay, so our basic... Uh, task for today. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the graphics pipeline, which you've seen a little bit reflected in this course, right? The, it used to be that the graphics pipeline was very much this, what we call a fixed function pipeline, meaning the, every, all the, everybody's graphics code more or less followed the same set of steps, right? You first you generate your triangles, then you shade, then you generate your fragments, and so on. Uh, and then over time, what's happened is the graphics pipeline has evolved from this, like, you know, I have one chip for doing triangle things and one chip, chip for rasterizing and one chip for this and so on to this like extremely generic device to the point where it's actually led to a lot of the breakthroughs we've had in AI are actually a big side effect of graphics hardware, right? Because your graphics card at this point is just this sledgehammer that can do so much computation uh, that it turned out to be valuable not just for generating pixels on your screen, but also for you know, processing large amounts of data. And, and so this was a realization maybe 10, 20 years ago uh, and really has changed the way we do computation and unfortunately for your instructor how your, your machine is, is, is actually kind of constructed, right? So we have to update and change our material all the time. So when we talk about processor architecture and graphics cards and all this kind of fun stuff, essentially the key word to remember is throughput, right? That your graphics card is not optimized to do, it's, it's not like, you know, this fine dental instrument of the computational world, but rather just like this sledgehammer whose job is just to shove as much data through simple computations as possible. And that like the cardinal sin in the GPU world is when you're not actively using your processor. Right? This is very different than like CPU stuff where like oftentimes when you write multi-threaded code, your thread will just like happily wait for some other thread to finish and that's, that's fine. Here, like if you're not using your GPU at any given instant, your task just is thrown out and like you move on to the next one because you always want to be using that, that computational power. And, and, and so that basic setup has really led to a very different pipeline in terms of just how data moves through uh, this processor uh, as you generate a rendered image or these days as you, 
do any kind of physical simulation, do rendering, train your deep network. All of these are basically making use of the same uh, architecture, which is pretty amazing. So before we get that, it's always fun to get a little nostalgic, look at some of the old style uh, graphics architectures and how uh, things have evolved over time because it does help us understand a little bit about how the GPU looks today, which is this like crazy Rube Goldberg machine of moving parts, passing data uh, all over the place. So of course, uh, some of the earliest uh, graphics hardware um, <laughs> had relatively rudimentary uh, uh, graphics uh, type algorithms inside of them, so probably the one of the earliest ones, not the earliest, but one of the earliest graphics uh, interfaces that people had in their home was uh, Pong, um, and which really was uh, basically a dedicated circuit whose job in life was specifically to draw, turn on and off the pixels for the game Pong, <laughs> right? And so back in those days, of course, if you wanted to make a new video game, what did you have to do? You had to design a new circuit that its job in life was to do that one video game and then everybody go out and buy that new device and plug it into their TV. Um, this is obviously quite different from the video games we have now where you put in a new what cartridge, CD, DVD, whatever, and then suddenly, or I guess these days connect to the internet and then suddenly you're just playing a completely different game, right? This hardware was, was not capable of that, um, nor was it capable of, of 3D effects, shading, just about anything. Uh, but of course things very rapidly evolved and, and some of the evolution happened because of demands of engineering industries and, and you know, video production and so on. Uh, and then in parallel with that, uh, really this is sort of home PC revolution was happening, right? This is, Pong was 1972, so it's just when we're starting to think about having a computer inside of your house. Uh, and, and pretty soon the, the level of sophistication that we got in these video games grew quite a bit. So here's a screenshot from a 1985 uh, video game. Um, notice here we have color. Uh, we also have one additional feature, which is what's creating what you might perceive as some detail here, which are like you have palm trees. Now at that time the graphics cards probably weren't actually capable of doing, like you couldn't interact with these palm trees, but rather they were just sprites. You guys remember what, the, what that means when you do sprites in video games? We talked about this a little bit. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And so a bunch of the memory that was used in these old video games was dedicated to just storing a few sprites, a few images, that then were just like slapped down a million times on the same uh, game to make a, a much more complicated environment. Right? So here uh, in our uh, Commando C64 game, uh, you can see the same palm tree just tiled a bunch of times. In fact, I believe that this palm tree is just reflected left, right from the other one uh, to get just you know, a little bit of variety in the scene. Um, but that was basically all the, uh, the uh, computational ability that we had. Um, so in these video games, you had a dedicated video chip, but it wasn't doing anything terribly, terribly complicated by today's standards. So if we fast forward, um, your instructor was born, and, and not that much later, they, uh, a big landmark in the video game 3D graphics uh, world appeared, which is a game called Doom. Has anybody played Doom before? You can in your browser, I believe, now. Um, only one. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, you should, you should go find it. Oh, two. Okay. Um, yeah, so Doom was, I, I think, in some sense, by today's standards, I mean, okay, obviously the graphics look pretty terrible by today's standards, but somehow the interaction isn't all that different from, from, from a lot of the sort of first-person shooters that you see today. Um, Doom also was uh, one of the earliest 3D-ish video games. Uh, and this basically incorporated kind of a clever little piece of technology, uh, w which was, you know, actual 3D rendering was still out of reach of these kinds of, of games. And you can see, right, I mean, these are flat characters and flat walls and so on. Um, but what Doom could do was scale an image. <laughs> that was it, right? And so if you wanted a character walking away from the camera, what could you do? Well, you could do that little amount of computation to figure out how much of the square on your computer screen that character should take up. And essentially just kind of shrink down the sprite um, so that it, there's some kind of illusion of depth. Now obviously when two characters walk past each other, some very strange things happen, right? Because really they're just planes. So like every once in a while, they're just kind of a change in the ordering. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, the rendering algorithm here was, was pretty much two-dimensional, right? Um, and, the, and the way that you could do this was just render one character at a time uh, just on top of each other in depth order. Anybody remember what that kind of algorithm is called? 
is called the painter's algorithm, right? The idea that you just paint one object at a time and you have no depth buffer. And, and so notice that like there, like, what is the name of the character in Doom? I forget this guy's name with the... With he doesn't really have that yet. He doesn't have a name? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, if they, if they, uh, they, they couldn't hug, right? Because if they did, this would create a big problem for the painter's algorithm, right? Because you would have like the arms would be behind, but the back would be in front and it wouldn't be clear how to resolve the, uh, the depth here. So, if we zoom forward to 1996, now this is squarely in the time period where I was, uh, well, I, my parents wouldn't allow me to have this stuff, but I'd go to the neighbor's house and go play over there. Um, finally, we had some of our very first 3D video games that happened uh, in the home. Uh, so one of the very first ones was Quake. It's a Doom and Quake, I feel like I always show up in the same sentence when graphics people are feeling nostalgic. Um, has anybody played Quake before? Well, it's pretty easy to see that Quake, uh, <laughs> It's very easy to see, incorporated 3D triangles. In fact, you can just see it right on this character here. Um, so in fact, uh, there really was true 3D stuff here. I believe there was a depth buffer in Quake. Um, obviously, you can see some texture mapping here. Um, there's a stupid amount of aliasing because these are done on like probably what, like aspect ratio that's roughly the size of a postage stamp. Um, but uh, yeah, this was this big breakthrough um, in video game technology and, and really led to the sort of gaming culture we have today. Um, notice there's also another kind of funny thing about this video game level in Quake. You notice anything about the entrance to this, this, this room? <laughs> it's really strategically uh, placed. Yeah. It's like very small and it's like in the distance, so you can't really see into the other You got it. Yeah, it's this very small entryway kind of hidden in the corner of the room. Uh, why, did, why did we do that? Why, what, what was going on from an engineering perspective? You got it. Yeah, the, 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 one of the most expensive parts of the rendering pipeline, as we all know, is, is just figuring out what you can see and what you can't. Um, presumably, there's like a whole other level of your video game on the other side of the ceiling here. And so if you're not careful with the size of the entryway between them, you're going to have to render all the triangles on both sides of the scene. Um, but by actually designing your video game levels very carefully, you know, making your video game actually happen inside of like a weird dungeon-y kind of environment with lots of small rooms, you could get around that. Uh, and so it was kind of a funny uh, place where, where technology affected art, if you want to call it that, and, and vice versa, um, to, to lead to the video games we see here. Now, Doom was completely on the CPU, uh, which is, uh, you know, most people didn't have dedicated graphics cards in their machines at that time, or if they did, they were less graphics cards and more video cards, like their job in life was to interface with your TV or something. Um, and, and, and so that was one of the big computational limiters, and certainly, while you were playing Do or Quake, you like couldn't be doing anything else on your, your machine. It really did take over the uh, computational environment. So continuing in our sort of historical effort, it's kind of fun to just look at these images and you can visually see the hardware evolve. Um, one of the next big uh, landmarks in the 3D uh, world, at least, was a game called Half-Life. At this point, I think some of you were alive. Um, so, right, in, in uh, Half-Life, uh, you can see uh, what's going on here is that now all of the characters are textured and there's special hardware specifically for rasterizing triangles which allowed the scene complexity to become much higher. So I, I don't think that the actual graphics techniques here were super different. I mean maybe you could have slightly better shading and lighting. Um, but the main difference here is just the level of detail, right? I mean these characters compared to the characters that you see in uh, Quake here are, are far more polygons, right? These guys are like just one step away from being sprites. Um, all right, and then finally, if we jump forward a bit more, suddenly the detail got way better in a lot of these video games. This is Half-Life 2. Half-Life 1 was, what, a couple years before this? Um, and this really was the big revolution in computer graphics sort of consumer hardware that we still see today. And the basic uh, revolution, I remember when this happened, I was playing with writing code and suddenly writing code got a lot harder for your, your graphics card than it was before, um, was essentially to give up forcing a graphics pipeline on all the people that were using your graphics card. Right? So it used to be in OpenGL 1.0, I still have all the docs on my, my shelf in my office, you can go take a look. Um, what you would do is like OpenGL 1.0 had a very 
clear list of steps that you would use to draw a scene. Right? The very first thing you'd do is place your camera, then you would give the triangles to the scene and load the textures, and then you'd pull the trigger and it would generate the fragments, and uh, you really didn't have any control over what happened in these individual steps. Um, starting in the early 2000s, the big invention, which was only an invention in graphics cards, it actually already existed in um, industry software, was programmable shading. And the basic idea here was that rather than having to do crazy hacks where you were like, had this sort of high level control over your rendering, but like you really wanted this special effect, just write a piece of code that your GPU runs rather than like just this high level stuff where somebody else is taking care of the rendering. Right, so for instance, OpenGL 1.0, you would do things like say, I want this shape to be Fong shaded and this one to be Limbertian shaded. Uh, but nowadays, you don't do any of that. Right? In fact, you guys all wrote your own shading code. Right? So the, the, the sort of later versions of OpenGL actually removed a lot of features and just added one, which was a new programming language that allowed you to write your own shader rather than just this fixed function thing. Um, these were initially really, really painful to use, and there was a big fight in the industry about who would control the standard over these things, as often happens, right? So there was CG was a tool that I think still exists, but isn't used all that often. Uh, Microsoft had some version inside of DirectX. Um, the OpenGL shading language, GLSL, came a little later, um, was another one of these sort of tools. That's the one you've used in your course, because that's the one tool that's the best you know, a cross-platform environment that's out there. So for a graphics class, that makes a big difference. Unfortunately, Apple has deprecated their support for OpenGL, so that may change, uh, which is annoying uh, for me. Uh, and, and a lot of other ones. So another uh, sort of programmable shading technology um, that came later was something called CUDA, uh, which was from OpenGL, or rather from NVIDIA. Um, and in that case, they sort of said, we're going to remove the graphics part of graphics programming entirely, right? So CUDA was just an, an interface directly to your graphics card. You could do whatever the heck computation you wanted um, and not have it like talk directly to your frame buffer or anything. You could just read memory in, do a computation, and put it back out. Um, the early days of this technology were really frustrating. Like, for instance, uh, I had an old laptop which somehow had a GPU in it at the time, so the laptop was about 95 pounds and not the most wieldy object. But uh, nowadays, if you write GPU shaders and like your code has an infinite loop or something, like it, what'll happen is it'll just turn it off. At the time, it didn't, and I had a GPU that just melted through the bottom of a laptop because these things use a huge amount of power, and uh, a lot of really bad things can happen. But anyway, the technology now is much better. You don't have this problem, uh, and life is pretty good. And these days, of course, we have GPUs that like, not only are just doing shading uh, computation, uh, shading inside of your video games, but also computation. Like, it could be doing the AI for your video game in another shader, just because like, there's so many characters you have to control. It's more efficient to do that, for example. Um, so nowadays, it's like this incredibly detailed, beautiful environments, all kinds of both screen space and 3D effects getting composited together into one of these games. Of course, another side effect is that we can now engineer video games much more quickly than we used to, uh, which makes some dark corners of the video game industry really just awful to work in. For those of you who are looking for jobs after graduation, you need to think twice about the, the industry unless you're really dedicated. Uh, but in any event, that's the sort of evolution that we have now. Of course, every year, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel come out with new technology um, that, that <laughs> obliterates my course material uh, and also accelerates both the graphics and computational pipelines. Um, there are all kinds of interesting issues hiding here, right? I mean, nowadays, like, you know, you see all these news articles about, like, training one deep network uses about the same amount of electricity as, like, a car in a year or some ridiculous amount like that. Um, and, and indeed, this kind of hardware presents a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to electricity usage and so on. Uh, and that's where a lot of the, the changes are happening now, especially because you're getting more and more sophisticated graphics cards in your pocket. And of course, these things can't use up nearly the kind of electricity that you can when you're plugged into the wall. Right? And so now there's still a little bit of room for clever graphics algorithms rather than just like really fast sledgehammers because we want to reduce the power draw that happens even if the computational speed is okay. Okay, so if we go back uh, through that same kind of list of technologies and now think a little bit more carefully about what was going on in these different things, the, it, it's worth kind of understanding the evolution of the different types of, the different pieces of the graphics pipeline uh, and how they changed with the hardware, right? So in the sort of first generation of 3D technology, which somehow the kind of funny thing is this persisted today in sci-fi movies, right? Like I feel like 
you see a lot of Wi-Fi or a lot of wireframe things and computer screens and and and, and science fiction, but the reality is that's the easiest type of rendering. Um, so the, the sort of first generation of tools, essentially all they could do is draw lines. There's no notion of occlusion or depth necessarily beyond just projecting stuff into screen space and drawing it all. Uh, and because of that you had like sort of fragment overwrite, meaning that if I generated another line that intersected one I'd already drawn, there was no notion of a depth buffer, right? So you just, you just turn it on again, which is okay for black and white or usually what green and black I think is the look that a lot of these tools had, um, but not so great if you had a scene that's much more complicated, or even in a single airplane that has like a lot of non-convexity to it. Right? So the sort of second generation of, of technology here, all kinds of things change, right? I mean, uh, now per vertex, we often did lighting calculation. So some of the cool lighting that you guys did in your assignment would not have been possible here, right? Like you would just compute one color per vertex of a triangle mesh and then interpolate it through the triangle rather than, so like your, for example, your shadow, right? Your shadow had this nice sharp edge, so that couldn't have happened here. Um, <coughs> there's some notion of depth and, and, and of course depth buffering, uh, which was needed, as well as color blending, meaning that you had one color per vertex and you could use barycentric coordinates to interpolate that color to the inside. There's no, no, uh, no texture mapping. This was, was true up until like kind of the early 90s. Maybe there'd be some very rudimentary texture mapping, like just some texture that was sitting in 3D that you could read off of the coordinate, but that was, that was about it. Uh, then we move on to the next generation, which is the early 2000s. Suddenly things became much, much more flexible, right? And so, uh, you know, starting with some of the early SGI hardware and then moving on to some of the more commodity devices, um, now we could have, you know, enough texture memory and hardware to actually do all this cool texture stuff that, that we see today. Maybe even some rudimentary anti-aliasing, probably on the level of like, draw your scene two times as large and then shrink it down by a factor of two to kind of have some average per pixel. Uh, and, and, and really this led to a big increase in, in the detail of 3D scenes simply because we were texturing, um, but uh, you know, in terms of the shading and, and the 3D effects, it was still fairly, uh, fairly limited. And then finally, we, we, we lead to the, the main technology we have now, which is maybe programmable shading, where you can do all kinds of cool stuff, right? You can mess with the normal vectors to your surface, you can generate textures on the fly, um, or code up whatever crazy psychedelic effect you want that varies over time, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Right? And so these days, in fact, this sort of latest generation, it's, just, it's not even programmable shading, it's programmable anything, right? Like any piece of your pipeline, somebody out there in the hardware world has probably tried to make work on the, on the GPU. Um, right, so if you look at the graphics pipeline that we've talked about, let's say we want to draw a triangle. Let's think about what these different hardware architectures kind of, what effect they have on how we will go about doing that. So the, the old uh, graphics pipelines look something like this, right? And, and this is not all that different from what we've covered in this course, right? The difference is just that you all coded these things. It used to be that this was built in. Right, it's kind of a funny thing. Now these tools like Unity sometimes will, will, will look closer to what OpenGL used to be. Um, but in any event, what, was, what did our pipeline look like? We would first you know, transform all the vertices into the, the frame of the camera, rasterize and, and generate our fragments, then maybe do some, some, some texturing, finally the, the depth test to figure out which fragments are on top, and then all this gets pushed back into the frame buffer. And this is still a useful abstraction, and the difference is that this used to be what your hardware looked like. Like literally, these arrows were like pieces of metal, and there were like boxes that, that were little computers that did each of these pieces. Again, I'm a theorist. I'm going to use really bad terminology today. Um, but th then what started to happen as people had stronger and stronger demands over the look of their 3D scene is that we started to introduce these different features. like. You know, maybe you want to be able to mess with vertices and, and pixels, so you write a little piece of code, and that's what gets sent off to these different pieces of the pipeline, right? So this is this idea of programmable shading. And then eventually, uh, we just got rid of this all together and just said, well, all these things are just big parallel operations, and that's what we really should make our, our hardware look like. So the two main places where we see parallel computing in graphics are in vertex and, and, and pixel or fragment shaders. You guys have implemented both of these on your assignment. Um, and you can think of them just like some function that goes, for example, on a vertex shader from maybe positions and attributes of a vertex to a new position, a new attribute. Notice that this has nothing to do with any of the other vertices, right? So this is massively parallel. 
I can apply this in any order to all the vertices of my, my triangulation. It doesn't matter because they're all just independent computation. Um, so a different way of putting that if you're like a programming language person is that this is functional, right? There's no, no side effect. Like it, the processing of vertex 10 doesn't affect the processing of vertex 23. Um, and so this can be used for all kinds of things, right? Animation, projection, uh, getting ready for shading, like doing some lighting computation, uh, and so on. And then usually what happens is you have a hardware whose job in life is basically generating, you know, rasterizing the inside of a triangle and generating barycentric coordinates, which you guys all know how to do by hand on graphics exams now. Uh, and, and, and then you hand that off to your, your fragment shader. So for some examples of, of vertex shaders that may be a little less obvious than what we've already seen in this course, um, here's one called blend shapes. Has anybody ever played with blend shapes? It's kind of fun. Um, so the idea here, uh, in fact, my very first research job at MIT uh, was as a high school student. Actually, in the year the, the Stata Center opened, my job was to click fiducial points on 3D faces. Uh, and uh, I, there's some data set out there that has a bunch of points that I click. Um, but in any event, have you, has anybody ever used principal component analysis in their statistics class? No? Wow, we don't have uh, too many learning students in here. Interesting. Um, that's okay. Uh, so, so let's say that I have a big collection of 3D faces and they all have the same triangle mesh. Right? So every single one, like triangle 5, always corresponds to your like, left eyebrow or something like that. Well, that can be super useful and, and it's not all that unrealistic. Like if you have a hand-designed 3D character, you could put that character into a lot of poses. Right? You could open their mouth, close their mouth, you could widen it, whatever. You get all kinds of different poses of your face. Then what could I do to animate this character? Well, it's really simple. I could just interpolate between the vertex positions in these two different poses. Notice that that's a little different from what we talked about before. Right? We talked about skinning, which is somehow this higher level thing where you have these transformations that's affecting the motion. Here, just vertex per vertex, like I have one 3D version of your face smiling, one version frowning. So if I want to interpolate between them, I just interpolate the vertex positions. Um, this is an idea called blend shapes, and it is typically used for faces and kind of local expression type stuff. Um, you can get like remarkably detailed facial animation by this, just this linear motion. Um, and so essentially what you do is you store some like resting, resting computer face and then, you know, like little delta vectors that point like this vector is going to point you toward a smiling face and this one's going to point you toward a frowning one. And then your animation is just interpolating between these things with different weighted averages. Uh, and this is like ideally suited for a vertex shader, right? Because at every single vertex, you have the same linear combination weights, and you're just combining together these different basis vectors to create a new piece of geometry. Does that make sense? Our cowbell outside agrees. Um, right, so, so this is a technique called blend shape, a very simple one. Another kind of related one, which we did see in this class, is skinning. Um, and skinning, really, you guys implemented it on the CPU, but it's extremely data parallel, right? Like every single vertex has its own skinning weights, but it's just, all it's doing is just combining, you, you know, different transformations to come up with a position. Uh, and since there's just like this giant for loop over vertices that happen inside of your code, that's roughly what the vertex shader will be doing. Yep. Uh, or let's see here. Uh, another uh, good example, which you guys coded on your last homework, was was just projection, right? So. I probably have the 3D pose of a shape in the world coordinate system. I want it in the coordinate system of the camera, so I just have to go through every single vertex multiplied by the same matrix. So you get the point. The vertex shader is essentially a thing that you apply to every single vertex of your, your meshes independently of one another um, in preparation for rendering. And then in the next part of your rendering, you have pixel or fragment shaders. I prefer fragment shader as a term because pixel kind of has this false understanding that it only happens once per pixel, but like if there's overdraw, like the same triangle, or two different triangles with the same pixel, then you'll hit the, you know, you'll, you'll generate more fragments than that. Um, and this essentially is just the thing that happens per position, right? So when you guys were doing your uh, shading code and dealing with shadows and so on, these were all uh, fragment shaders. And again, they're just functional objects that can do all kinds of good stuff, right? They can do texture lookups and, 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 and so on. So some examples include lighting, right? So you probably want to do lighting in a fragment shader, right? Because if you did it in a, a vertex shader, the inside of your triangle would just be like this smoothed out version of color that's unaware of your 3D scene. Right? Um, and of course, these get more and more complicated. 
uh, here's like a really crazy one that's like melting ice where there's like some animated texture so there's like a time variable that's going into your shading which is fine right that's just a what you would call a uniform variable remember um, so this would be kind of like procedural rendering there's like a bump map associated to it where you're like messing with the normal vector all this is the kind of stuff that you want to do per pixel right it's pretty amazing by just composing together a few of these effects the kind of cool uh, looks that you can get or for a completely different look, uh, which I think some of you guys propose in your course projects. By the way, you should have all received grades for your course project proposals, and those grades should all be 10 out of 10. Um, and with every single proposal, there's a comment inside of that learning module thing. It's very hard for me to know if you can actually see it or not, but I tried. Uh, they, yeah, they were all there by midnight last night. In any event, um, your shaders don't have to be photorealistic. Right? In, in, in our class, we've largely focused on capturing the physical world, but one of the really beautiful things about graphics is that you can come up with whatever shading technology you want, and it doesn't have, any, have to do any, at all with, with light if you don't want it to. Um, so a good example is a toon shader, um, exactly what it sounds like. Its job in life is to make your scene look like a cartoon. Um, so the, the, some images on the left hand side are, are, are shown uh, that do that kind of thing. So in a toon shader, what you do is maybe you do your actual lighting calculation, like maybe this is fong shaded, and then you just take the color that came out of your lighting calculation and you do some crazy thing. Like you, maybe you round it off to a palette of 10 colors that you have available. Or like this is a more sophisticated one where it looks like what they did is they had a palette of like what red, white, and black. But then if you had a color that was kind of in between, they let you, you know, smoothly interpolate or whatever. There's no science here. Right? This is just like a made up artistic effect. Uh, but you can, you can make some really beautiful things, right? So you can do tune shading, maybe some crazy volumetric effect like fur, you can try and do painterly rendering. Painterly rendering is a little bit trickier because typically paint strokes take up more than one pixel, um, which, which makes it hard to do in screen space. And so when you put all these things together, you get these really beautiful effects. I mean, at this point, these images are even pretty dated, uh, but already starting in, 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 in uh, Half-Life 2 and moving forward, Suddenly we could have complex materials on our scenes, we could have textures that were moving and dynamic and responding to the characters in, 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 in really detailed ways. Um, and the, the, I mean, the just incredible thing is that this happens these days like on your laptop, right? You, you guys aren't appreciating enough, but this is like ridiculously cool. Um, right, so yeah, so that's our, our basic uh, our hardware pipeline. And as you can see, the two red squares here are the ones that you guys all now know how to program, right? That's what you did on your assignment. But then, of course, there's this big annoying thing that happens with graphics and uh, artists and video game programmers, which is, you, you know, you give them an inch, they ask for a mile, right? So we had now this programmable feature, you could get these cool effects, and then suddenly they're, you know, back knocking on NVIDIA's door saying, well, those were cool, but like, what if I wanted, I don't know, a character that like ballooned out in shape over time or something? Well, that would be kind of tricky because this whole pipeline depends on a fixed number of triangles, right? There's, there's nothing here that can like produce a triangle mesh on the fly. Um, so maybe uh, you start introducing what uh, people call a geometry shader, right? Which was like, for example, remember we talked in lecture three or four about subdivision operators that takes a piece of geometry and makes a new piece of geometry. So for a little while, some of the graphics card companies were uh, uh, manufacturing these cards that specifically were for geometry uh, type subdivision operators. So you could do that really quickly, which was pretty cool, right? Because it meant that you could like make a really, really detailed 3D shape without storing it explicitly, right? You just do all those subdivision operators and then render. Um, and then people said, well, wait a second, like maybe I want to like dynamically remesh while I'm at it. So maybe I add a tessellation shader. And suddenly this pipeline started getting ridiculously, ridiculously complicated, right? Or maybe, um, I don't know, whatever. There, there, there were a bunch of different things that people played with. And essentially what ha kept happening was like somebody put in a little feature request for like some new cool effect that they wanted in their game or their CAD software, whatever. You'd add a new something shader to it. The term shader at this point is totally overloaded. It just means like parallel thing. Uh, and and these, these, the complexity of these graphics cards really exploded. Um, so then, uh, eventually, what the, 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 the computer architecture people kind of figured out, or what they probably knew all along and were secretly doing, even though they were showing us pipelines that looked like this, uh, was that the whole thing collapsed on, uh, in on itself. Right? And that they, they really rethought the graphics pipeline and just said, well, what really is going on in computer graphics is just stupid amounts of computation really, really fast optimized for throughput. So we're just going to make a graphics card that does that and you people can decide what you want to do with it. Right? And, and, and that's really the technology that we have today. Right? So um, when you write 
shaders and, and OpenGL code and all this stuff, OpenGL does very little of the graphics for you, right? At this point, that's your job. Um, makes your assignments a lot harder than they used to be, uh, which is actually true. Uh, and, and so really, your architecture from starting from this, this crazy pipeline of a million steps just collapses down to one step with a big loop going right back to it, saying that like, well, on the outside, you can decide what you want your GPU to do, and we're just going to give you different features that expose the parallelism that your GPU is good at. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to walk you guys through some of the features of a modern GPU architecture. This is the best I could get out of reading their documentation, which is a painful and boring job, and I hated it. Just FYI. So here's your typical modern GPU architecture, which to me just looks like this crazy, you know, Rube Goldberg machine worth of like, you know, things interacting and moving around and um, talking to each other in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, but this really is like the complexity here is just amazing. So here's a, a fun uh, question for you. This is called a graphics card, right? It's called, this is a graphics processing unit. How much of this graphics card actually implements graphics algorithms? It's not zero, actually, right? Your, your graphics card really does do some stuff on your computer, right? It, like, it, you know, it's, it's pretty good at, at scan conversion, for example. Just roughly, anybody have a guess, like, what percentage of these squares here correspond to, like, computational units that have anything to do with computer graphics? How many of us vote? 50%. 25, 10, 5. It would probably be closer to 5 or 10%. So here are these areas that I've highlighted in red. So these ones have to do with some, some polygons and, and uh, rasterization is, is going on. That's it. The rest of this is just general purpose computational object. Um, so it's really amazing. Most of the, the graphics part of the graphics card has been removed at this point and is actually handled in software in kind of a funny way that like, your software has a bunch of, maybe you're using Unity, and there are like a bunch of GPU shaders that tell the, you know, wrangle the GPU into doing your graphics computation, and we kind of secretly know that this architecture is good at that kind of computation, but they're not actually implemented in hardware anymore. That's, that's just not a thing we have to do. Uh, right, so in particular, the kind of objects you have here, um, there's a rasterization engine, which does exactly what you would say, a thing, and a polymorph engine, 4.0, in the Titan X GPU. Titan X is a few years old, but I, I checked this morning and, and the architecture hasn't changed a ton in the new NVIDIA cards. I think it's getting harder and harder to sell these things at this point. They're like really, really good at what they do. Um, this includes like some tessellation, you know, some of the, the sort of tricky things that you either have to do a, like a gajillion times, like projecting of, of vertices, or things that are just kind of tricky to do in parallel, like, like tessellation, right? The generating triangles is a famously annoying parallel task. Um, and so, yeah, so like this very, very small portion of your, your, your chip, like literally just if you count surface area, is actually dedicated to graphics specific stuff, although we still call it your graphics card. So, you know, we, we win. Um, on the other hand, to the remainder of your card um, is uh, what at this point we would call GP GPU technology. Does anybody know what that, that stands for? General purpose. General purpose is the GP. So it's a, a GP GPU programming was the idea that okay, your graphics card is really this object that, you know, at this point we've forgotten the graphics part. And so this is all, um, right, just a, a computational device that is optimized for throughput. That's how you should understand it. And what makes it fast is essentially the fact that you can handle massive numbers of independent work items, right? Like if different pixels had to talk to each other to like decide on a color, like if any of you guys are taking a graphical models class, you're like trying to simulate a, I don't know, a POTS model or whatever, that would be a big problem, right? Because then you couldn't do this massive parallel computation without any synchronization. Um, but in graphics you can, and in a lot of other areas you can as well. Uh, but there's also some other things that are helping us out. Another one is data locality. Um, does anybody know what that is if you've taken an architecture course? So you can roughly think of your memory in your computer like a big line of bits. Not all that surprising. And it, but it actually does have like some geometry associated to it. Like it really is just a big array of, of information. Probably more than one, but whatever. So it turns out that when you're engineering a piece of hardware architecture, like your graphics card, locality matters a lot. Namely, it's easy to pull a big chunk of data from one contiguous piece of your memory. That takes a lot less time than pulling data like a little bit over here, a little bit over there, some of this, a bit there. 
And in fact, by default, both in your, your graphics card and in your CPU, typically what happens when you fetch memory out of your, your RAM, which is slow, um, is it just grabs memory nearby and says like, well, it cost me nothing to just take this big chunk and maybe I'll get lucky and hit the jackpot and the next computation you'll do will just happen to be like the next element in the array. And just say, oh, like, you, you know, like in Martha Stewart when she, you know, she puts the turkey in the oven and then she like walks to the next oven and opens it and the, the cooked turkey is already there. Somehow that's like what your graphics card is trying to do, right? Like it grabs a big piece of memory and then, you know, you request, you know, you've got some big for loop over all the elements of the array, you re request the next element of the array, and your graphics card says, oh, well, conveniently, I just happen to have this here, right? Uh, and so this is this idea of, of data locality that you want to minimize the number of times that you access data that is not built into your chip, right? So your graphics card is composed of lots of different chips, like there's a big piece of memory that holds your frame buffer and all that stuff, and then there's a smaller piece of memory which is glued right onto the computational unit, there's a reasonable question here, which is why not make all of your memory out of that? And it turns out it's very expensive and has some uh, electrical issues. Um, and what you don't want to have to do is page data back and forth between those things too much, right? So if, if you're in computer architecture, they talk a lot about, you know, the hierarchy of, of, of data, right? That there's like the memory right next to your chip, and then there's the RAM in your graphics card, and then there's the RAM on your computer, and then your hard drive. And each one of these is like a factor of 100 or 1,000 latency to page up information, kind of moving up that ladder. And so you want to minimize the number of times you have to do that. So there's that, and now um, there's some other cool features that happen in your graphics card that make it even faster and more interesting, right? So for instance, there's this sort of custom scheduling, meaning that you'll have a bunch of threads running at the same time, and your graphics card has like this other chip which is running around and looking like, is this thread ready to go? Good, then I'll, I'll sort of compute this one next. Uh, and so that essentially you never have a dull moment on your GPU. Right? There's always computation happening. That's what you want. Um, and there are a few fixed function uh, units, right? Those are those little squares that we showed on the, the card for those, these tasks that just happen all the time on your, on your machine. So the way to understand it is in the graphics workload, essentially there's this big number of independent kind of similar things to do, and it's very math heavy, right? You're doing a lot of arithmetic, there's some floating point hiding in there, and that's what you want to accelerate. And typically your, your memory access is coherent, right? We have tons of for loops that are just for every pixel do this, right? And so you can just grab, or like for instance, if you're doing texture lookups, if you do two adjacent pixels, probably the texture lookup they do is very close to each other, right? Uh, and so these sorts of things can really help accelerate your code. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you're writing really complicated code like an operating system, then there are all these complex dependencies, like this thing has to wait before that thing can finish and so on. Um, and that's where your, your, your CPU uh, is, is more important, right? So, uh, the sort of keywords here is graphics is throughput sensitive. Um, the sort of CPU based coding is very latency uh, sensitive. Okay, right. So there's so many challenges. If you go and, and your job is to engineer this kind of hardware, it's uh, extremely difficult to do so and to make products that people still want to buy. Uh, you know, a moral, uh, you can debate whether Moore's law is coming to an end or not. Uh, but the reality is that clock speeds for GPUs are not increasing all that much. In other words, like the amount of time, like microseconds it takes to add two numbers together is not like somehow decreasing anymore quite as much as it used to from one chip to the next. And in fact, uh, power consumption is super linear in gigahertz. So you want to double your speed, then you're going to have to more than double the amount of electricity that it draws. This is a big problem. Like for instance, I run a research group that uses entire racks of GPUs and it like heats my grad student's office. I had to get a special power supply and it's, it's uh, an uncomfortable scenario to be in. And so the direction that these guys are moving rather than making a single computation faster is just doing more of them at the same time, right? And that's what these architectures are, are optimized for, right? I mean, if you look at this image, it's amazing. All these little squares are computational units. And they're all, you know, no one of them is particularly fast, but if I have two CPUs, then I've doubled my speed, right? And, and so that's the way that we're uh, making these machinery uh, do faster. There's some other uh, realities. So DRAM is the kind of memory that you use to store your frame buffer and like these big pieces of stuff at a time is very slow. And so essentially uh, another kind of big piece of the uh, engineering here uh, is to sort of get as much of the memory and information as close to your processor as possible. Uh, and so there's some ways to do that, right? If you do this in the CPU fashion, then maybe you have very big on-chip caches, meaning that like 
a lot of memory that's like plugged right into your uh, thing that's doing your computation, your ALU. But that, that can get really expensive really fast, and if your graphics card has 64 threads in it, you're going to need 64 of the units uh, uh, hanging around uh, to do that kind of computation. But there's some other kind of clever ideas. So for, for instance, you can maybe reorder the instructions in your code uh, to minimize uh, latency. So like if I know that this line of code is going to require a bunch of memory, maybe I go ahead and start paging that memory early, do a lot of other stuff, and come back. But that sort of comp uh, dynamic computation requires, or, or is really engineered for this sort of unpredictable piece of code with like lots of if statements and for loops where I don't know where they're going to end. On the GPU, Somehow the engineering is actually much simpler. Rather than doing all this clever stuff, the GPU just, is, it's like, you know, some of my office hours have been like this when there's like a million people in my room and I can't deal with, with all of you people at the same time, which is like if you don't have a coherent question to, to ask, you just say, okay, fine, like go do your thing and go talk to the next guy. And that, in a nutshell, is what your GPU is optimized to do, right? That like essentially rather than all these clever things where like, you know, maybe you're still formulating your question, so I'm going to go, like, turn my head to the other guy, tell them, like, you start thinking about this thing, and now let's discuss your problem. Uh, the GP, GPU just says, like, oh, okay, you're not ready, cool, like, just go do your thing, uh, you know, let me know when, you, when, you, when you're ready to go. Uh, and so, essentially what this allows you to do is your execution is much simpler. Like, you're going to grab big chunks of threads that are all doing the same code and all have all the data they need and just run them all at the same time and take care of them, throw them out, and then just grab the next one, and just keep grabbing whatever is at the top of the queue, A, and B has all the data that it needs, so that not just one thread can do its computation, but all the threads in a big clump of threads are, are ready to go. Right? And, and this is the sort of interesting architecture. If this sounds complicated, that's because it is. <laughs> uh, and, and, and there's a ton of work in engineering that goes into making each of these things, and one of the things that every day you should thank your lucky stars is that the people who have engineered this technology have made it totally uh, transparent to you guys, right? Like, it, it, if you switch to, like, you know, from the Titan X to the Titan V, you don't have to, like, rewrite all of your code. Um, which, there was a time when, when you did. Um, right, so here we're going to talk a little bit about what, what the graphics card world calls a streaming multiprocessor. By the way, reading the documentation here is really frustrating because half of it is written by, like, advertising professionals and the other half by engineers, and it's like got this weird messed up union between the two. Um, but essentially, the idea here is going to be you have multiple threads. When I say threads, do you guys know what I mean? These are like pieces of code that can run in parallel. But the difference between multi-threading on your CPU and what's going to happen in your graphics card, on your CPU, there's just a bunch of threads, and they're all doing their own thing, and it doesn't matter. That's fine. On your GPU, you have a bunch of threads, but they're all actually running the same code. So you're going to take a bunch of threads and kind of cluster them together into what we're going to call warps. And a warp is like a little collection of threads that all have the same set of instructions. And we're going to execute code in warps at a time. So whereas threads run in parallel, warps are like a little parallel computation that is itself SIMD, right? Single instruction, multiple data. Um, but there's also multiple threads going on in the sense that like, Maybe I'm playing Quake on my computer and Windows is like trying to, you know, draw menu bars on the side of the screen. And so like some of my warps correspond to making fragments for my, my animated characters and the other ones correspond to like drawing the UI on my computer. And that's fine. My computer's just going to keep pulling out whichever one is ready to go. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of how this thing is uh, set up. Right. So like your multi-core CPU can run like a few threads really fast. Uh, here, we're going to just run like a stupid number of threads fast-ish, but there's going to be even more threads than the number of threads we can run at any given time. So rather than trying to accelerate any one thread going quickly, we're just going to say if you're not fast, you know, like if, if, you're, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen kind of scenario instead. Right? And so, so that's what's going on here. In order to engineer these kinds of things, you need all kinds of crazy additional kind of accoutrement, right? Like, for instance, you need high bandwidth memory to sit right next to your, your, your processor so that they do have the data they need. And moreover, that they can, while one guy is processing this data, the next data is like being sent in the other side. Uh, and so it's just incredible. When you look at these architectures, all the different pieces that are going on. So let's, let's zoom into a little piece here. So here's a, a little square in our uh, computational device. And you can see all the different pieces here, uh, right? So within this architecture, we have an instruction cache. This is the thing that's sort of storing the piece of code that our threads are about to do. Uh, 
um, you know, and instruction buffer, which is, I guess, what the warp literally is about to do, as opposed to the cache, which is what's getting loaded from uh, memory. You have your register, which is the sort of local piece of memory that you're operating on. And then all of these things are different cores. They're all different things that can, can happen uh, in parallel computationally. But notice that they're all coupled to one instruction buffer. They all have to do the same thing. Right? So we want big chunks of code that are all running the same uh, set of instructions. Um, so inside of here we have you know, your register file, single precision arithmetic logic units. That's what ALU stands for. Anybody know the difference between single and, and double precision? This has to do with like the number of bits that you use to store a floating point number. In computer graphics, we tend to like single precision, meaning fewer bits. Sometimes that also means that you can't, there's not scientific notation, like the position of the decimal point is fixed. And that's because the math is slightly easier, but it's lower precision. And in graphics, we don't care because your eye isn't sensitive to those last couple bits anyway, right? So like, why, why bother? Um, some modern GPUs are, are reconsidering that because in machine learning, those extra bits sometimes can, can matter. Maybe you do have a few double precision ALUs. Notice that there's fewer of them, right? Those are the yellow guys. And then you have L1 cache, which is like sitting right next to your computer, uh, your, your computational ability, right? This is the cached uh, data and, and a little bit of shared memory uh, that goes across these things. And of course, there's one additional object here, which is the scheduler. And this is this sort of magic uh, 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 computational device, which is sort of choosing what warps are ready to go and making sure they're all running in lockstep when they run the, the piece of code they need. So these threads are executed in warps, which are like clusters of 32 threads that all have a similar set of instructions. And essentially what happens is the scheduler, the streaming multiprocessor, chooses which of the warps to ex execute to just make sure that the warps are ready to go. So as soon as all of those 32 threads have the data that they need, then you say, aha, you can go, you load up the, 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 the instructions into the cache and you start moving. Uh, and this way, they don't have to synchronize, everything can go at the same time. And then within one of these warps, now we run a piece of code, they all share the same program counter. I don't know if these are computer architecture terms you guys have seen before or not. If not, then these are going by pretty fast. Um, a program counter is kind of like there's like a wall clock in the back of the room and you have like 10 different threads now, right? And I have a piece of code with like 10 lines of code and the, there's like a guy standing there saying, okay, now everybody run line one of code, <laughs> right? So the program counter is one. And then when they all finish, the program counter says, okay, you're good, now do line two, <laughs> right? And, and, and so essentially all the threads in the warp are going to share the same uh, program counter as they move through uh, the instructions here. And so this is what's called the sim t instruction or execution uh, model. So remember, we've, we've, so far we've heard of, of SIMD. You guys remember what this, is, this uh, stands for? Single instruction, multiple data. Right? This idea that often we're doing graphics computation, we're just like doing the same arithmetic over and over again. In SIMT, it's a little more complicated than that. You take different threads, each of which have the same instruction set, so they all kind of glue together. But the different threads don't have to do the same things. Like, so it, the different warps could correspond to like operating system over here, video game over there, whatever. But within each of the warps, you have a SIMD execution model. Uh, and, and, and so that's the, 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 the sort of difference that happens here. Now, one thing, in case this wasn't complicated enough, uh, that can happen is you can group multiple threads together um, that actually have slightly divergent pieces of code. So, in fact, you guys might have, have noticed this when you wrote your shaders for your homework assignment. You had an if statement in there. Do if statements make any sense when you write a shader? Like, in, in this execution model, could they be in the same warp? At least the way I've described it so far? Not really, right? Because, like, let's say I have one piece of code for, like, if I'm a shadow, do this kind of rendering. If I'm not in a shadow, do that kind of rendering. And I group them all together into one warp, what's going to happen? Well, again, they all have to run the same piece of code. And this is a problem, right? Because you could have like 10 fragments that are shadows and 10 fragments that are not, and they all have to do the same thing, but it's not clear what their computation should be. How do you think this is dealt with in, in practice? What do, we, what do we do? Mm hmm yeah, so that would be one solution, would be like just to sort of divide the code into before, after, during, 
I guess probably four, right? Before the if statement, during the if statement, you know, the if, the then, and then all the stuff that happens after. Um, that'll be one, but it's a little bit tricky because you don't know which of those groups you're going to be in until after the first thing executes, right? So like you can't do this in a really systematic way without a clever, you, you would have to communicate back to the scheduler that something changed, right? Uh, what, other, what other solution do we have? Yeah. Take a guess and cross your fingers. Uh, you could do that. I, I think it would be hard to convince uh, precision-oriented graphics people to uh, uh, buy into that kind of equipment. Uh, any other any other ideas? So what happens uh, in a lot of these different architectures is you run both sides of the if statement. Yeah. So for instance, uh, let's see if we can write a little piece of pseudocode to see what that would look like. So has anybody ever played, in C++, there's a weird operator. It's called question mark colon. So you have a binary or a, a Boolean variable here. And then if that's true, this. If it's false, that. Yeah? So let's write a, a piece of code here. So let's say that I have, I don't know, if a is less than 7, then you know t equals 3, else or 3 plus 5, let's, let's actually like make it do some computation, else t equals 5 plus 7. Any smart compiler, by the way, would just do the arithmetic for you, but whatever. You know. And then uh, we're going to return t. Right? This is the world's simplest branching. So one thing that we could do is the following. And this is actually what roughly happens inside of your, your graphics card. Uh, at least as of a couple of years ago, although as with many of these technologies, it's changing very rapidly. Uh, which is we're going to translate this piece of code into something very different. So we're going to make t1 equals 3 plus 5, t2 equals 5 plus 7, and then t equals a less than 7. If that's true, return t1. If it's false, Return T2. What's the problem here? Computate, like, like from a speed perspective. Well, in my code over here, how many additions am I ever going to carry out? One, right? Either this guy or that guy. What happened over here? I did them both, right? So, okay, in this example, you could obviously, you could fix this very easily, and I'm sure your, your compiler could, could detect that, like, there's a much easier way to do this. But, let's say that I have a really complicated piece of code. Like, I, I want to render a crystal ball, but the crystal ball only takes up a few, you know, pixels in my screen. So, if, you know, I see the crystal ball, I have to do all this crazy light computation, Fresnel integral, whatever. And otherwise, I'm just rendering the, like, Lambertian background in my scene. So I have a big if statement at the top of my shader. If I'm inside of the crystal ball, do that. If I'm not, then do this other thing. And 99% of my pixels are not inside of that crystal ball. And I render my scene. Is that going to be fast or slow? Slow. slow. Because every single pixel is going to pretend like it has that, 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 that fancy shading model. And then it's just going to throw it away. <laughs> because this is still faster from an engineering perspective than implementing an if statement in a GPU. <laughs> yeah? and, 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 and that's really what's going on here. Um, but we'll see that there are some, some ways out of that. So here's a, another example, right? So um, you know, if a is less than 10, then increment small. Otherwise, increment big. Um, so a slight kind of reorganization. So this is actually sort of closer to what the, the system code looks like. You know, typically, the if actually happens before the computation. So maybe I check if a is less than 10, right? So that's Notice that LT is here, right? Well, then I'll uh, go to P0 and otherwise not P0. And so essentially what I can do is just mark lines of code. Like this line of code corresponds to, you know, the positive part of the if statement. This line of code corresponds to the negative part of the if statement. So what's going to happen when I have all of my threads running in this warp, they're all going to execute this line of code and decide, should my label be P0 or not, not P0? And now when the program counter goes to line two, right? So, so here we're going to set the predicate register, <laughs> right? So register is a fancy word for like little piece of memory that, that you're storing some data on your, your, your 
device. And so now, every single uh, 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 computation, or every single thing that's happening in parallel inside of your warp, they all now have a value p naught, right? p naught is just a Boolean, it's a single bit. Okay? So now your program counter goes to line 2 here. And essentially, what's going to happen is every single line of system code inside of your GPU is just going to have like a little set of binary numbers next to it. And essentially, what's going to happen is if that thing doesn't agree with the binary number that your thread has, your thread's just not going to do anything in that loop. When I say loop, I mean over the different threads, right? Um, but you still have to wait for all the threads, uh, the other threads, to do that computation. Notice that this is slightly faster than I wrote here. So now, like, you know, if my thread really wanted to do five plus seven, then I might not have to do that. This other piece of the sum, but I still have to wait for everybody else to decide to do that. Right, and then similarly here, um, I can check zero. Notice the way that this is probably implemented is that there's just like a little set of bits that's associated with like your if statements, right? So like your current if statement is either zero or one, and that's telling you what lines of code to run. What impl implication do you think this has for graphics uh, code? In particular, can I write a shader with like 50 nested if statements? Probably not. There's probably actually an upper bound on the number of if statements that you can have nested inside of each other, right? Because every single one of them is going to require a different register dedicated to am I inside of this if statement or not. So I'm going to need some set of bits. And then what's going to happen in each of these lines is checking, like, is bit number 5, 1, or 0, then run this code or not, right? Um, but if I have too many, I overload the, uh, the size of my uh, predicate registers, then probably your code just won't compile. And unfortunately, this is actually a function of your hardware, right? Like, you might have more predicate registers in an NVIDIA uh, Titan X than you do in, like, some other thing, ATI. In which case, notice that there was kind of a funny thing that happened in your assignment, which is that your code compiled at runtime, right? When you wrote that shader, it compiled at the beginning of your running. It didn't happen when you called make. Well, the reason for that is that it actually has to recompile depending on what computer you're on, right? Because if you have a different graphics card, then you need different types of instructions behind the scenes to make your, your shader work out. So, you know, that, that takes care of some uh, nested if statements. What about for loops? <laughs> How do I do for loops? Yeah? Would you just kind of unroll it in the way that you would? That's exactly right. So if I have a for loop from 1 to 10, I'd probably take my piece of code and copy it 10 times. Um, this gets really tricky because, can I have a while loop? Not easily, <laughs> right? Because while loops, we don't know when they're going to end, so I can't just copy the internals a bunch of times, right? You could do some crazy things like, you know, say I'm going to have a while loop but have an upper bound of the number of times that it runs, and every single time check, like, you know, a predicate register, like, am I still in the while loop or not? But that's going to be super expensive. Right? Uh, and so typically, graphics programming, you want to avoid that at all cases. Um, there's other clever things you can do. So one thing, I think one of you guys mentioned here, if every single thread in your warp has the same predicate register, then you really can skip that piece of code. And, and some of the modern GPUs are smart enough to realize that. So what they do is they look at the cache of instructions and they say, like, okay, the next 10 lines of code are all for you know, predicate register 0. But we know that all of our threads currently are in the not case of that. So we'll just skip to that other line, um, which is pretty amazing. So the slides include some, some special cases even for, you know, if we wanted to like call another function and so on. Things get very complicated very fast. Uh, but maybe we'll skip over this because I think we're a little low on time. Ah, Jesus. Right. So the benefits here are that we can support all of these different constructs that we have in C++. Uh, but of course, the thing you have to be careful about is that they are not implemented in your graphics card the same way that you're used to them being implemented in your computer. And what that means is that uh, you can uh, write a piece of code that like, you'd be used to in C++, like it really wouldn't affect the speed of your, your, your shader all that much, but then like, suddenly it grinds to a halt. Right? And, and, and these are the kinds of reasons why. Right? That, that, like, what's going on when you compile that shader is all kinds of crazy unrolling of your code because, again, you just have this giant sledgehammer that just wants to hit every single nail the same way. Um, 
Thankfully for you, unless you really care about performance and you're right on the edge of that 30 frames per second number, you probably never have to think about this stuff, right? As long as you stay in the confines of what GLSL allows you to do, you'll be in good shape. So, uh, right, the, cons the, the basic takeaway here is that oftentimes in SIMT processing, an if statement takes the same number of cycles regardless of the number of threads for which that if is true, right? And, and that's just a really weird uh, uh, property. Um, right, so uh, there's our, our basic trade-off between SIMT and SIMD, right? SIMT, you have incoherence, meaning that you can have if statements, but you take a big performance hit if it happens all that much. Um, SIMD, you just simply can't have if statements. Everybody's got to do the same computation. Okay, so to recap a little bit for the day here, Essentially, hopefully what you've gotten out of this is that GPU architecture is complicated and it's really different from what you're used to if you're used to thinking about your, your CPU, right? You're used to thinking about this one really fast processor whose job in life is to do very complex things. This instead is a thousand really slow processors whose job in life is to just take the easiest thing and do it really fast. <laughs> yeah, and, and so essentially that has led to a completely different execution model, the SIMT idea where you have threads that cluster together and then all the threads have the same program counter. Uh, but even though the individual threads are slower, just the fact that there's so many is what's getting you uh, the speed that we see in the modern kind of graphics technology. And all of this is optimized basically for throughput. So that's actually all I got for you guys today. Are there any questions and or what we'll, we'll call it? I know you're about to go on break. Excellent. All right. Well, have a lovely holiday, and I will see you a week from today.